Hello and welcome uh, to today's annual Ex-Dean Lecture with Professor Suzanne Mettler. It's my great pleasure today on behalf of the Jack Pelpson Center for the Study of Democracy and the Department of Political Science here at UC Irvine to welcome Professor Suzanne Mettler of Cornell University to deliver her lecture, Four Threats, the Recurring Crisis of American Democracy. It's um, going to have trouble with my Zoom book, but <laughs> I'm holding up a copy of Professor Mettler's outstanding book, uh, which will be the basis of today's talk. Um, today's lecture honors Harry Eckstein. Um, established in 1999, the annual Eckstein Lecture uh, recognizes Harry Eckstein for his contributions to the study of democracy and his role in co-founding the UCI Center for the Study of Democracy. Um, Professor Eckstein was a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, fellow for the Center of Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, a Guggenheim Fellow, and also UC Irvine's first distinguished professor and then distinguished research professor of political science. Today's Eckstein lecture is going to be delivered by Professor Suzanne Mel Mettler. Professor Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions at Cornell University, and her research um, has influenced many of us spanning topics in American political development, inequality, public policy, and political behavior and democracy. Um, she's author of six books, um, including most recently, Four Threats, the Recurring Crisis of American Democracy. Professor Mettler, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're very, very pleased and give you our Zoom welcome. Um, as, as she prepares to give a talk, I just want to remind the audience, please, as they come to you, put questions in this question and answer button at the bottom of the Zoom. I will moderate the talk. It's very nice to see questions arrive as they come in. And at the end of this discussion, we will use these questions for a moderated discussion with Professor Mettler. Thank you so much, Graham. It is lovely to be with all of you today. Of course, I only wish I was there in person. Um, I, uh, I've been to Irvine just once, and that was several years ago. It was a conference that Helen Ingram had organized and uh, that was right down on the beach. And it was held in January. And of course it was lovely, but I somewhat regretted it for months later because I came back home to, to upstate New York where I've spent most of my life and you know, very happy to live in upstate New York generally. But that felt to me like the longest worst winter after seeing that life can be different in such a beautiful place as you all live. Um, and um, I'm reflecting now that I was supposed to be with you in person one year ago uh, in March. Um, and it was the first event that I had to cancel because of the pandemic and life as we knew it changed. But I'm glad to be together with you at least on Zoom today. And uh, thank you so much for coming. On January 6th, we watched in horror as hundreds of Trump supporters stormed the US, the US Capitol, trying to interfere with the final step in certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election. They desecrated the sanctuary of American democracy with their Confederate flags and Nazi symbols, and by trying to overturn the will of voters with brute force. Six people died, and many police officers were bad, badly wounded, and indeed, it could have been much worse. Most shocking of all, the insurrection was incited by the president himself, who had spent the previous months denying his loss in the presidential election, despite all evidence to the contrary. To their credit, members of Congress reconvened that evening and ultimately conf confirmed the election results. But 139 members of the House Republican Caucus, the majority, plus several Republican senators, refused to recognize the election results. Rob Lieberman and I sent our book, Four Threats, off to publication just a year ago, last spring. Then over the next half year, leading up to the election and in the months that followed it before the inauguration, damage to American democracy escalated. And so many events that occurred reminded us of occurrences in the American past that we had written about in the book, other times when democracy was in danger. The January 6th insurrection took us back to the late 19th century. And uh, now I want to share my screen with you. 
okay. So uh, in the decades following the Civil War, democracy for those who had rights to participate was quite vibrant. And at that time, it included African-American men in the South who had gained voting rights and were participating at high rates in elections and running for office primarily as Republicans. Also, the People's Party emerged in 1892 out of the agrarian populist movement, and it too began to run candidates quite successfully. But at that very juncture, democracy was thrown into crisis. Let's zoom into North Carolina in the 1890s. There, Republicans and populists noticed that if they joined forces and ran candidates on what they called a fusionist ballot, they stood a chance of beating the Democrats who were at that time in the South, the party that was run by white elites. And that's what they did. In 1896, the fusionists managed to elect Republicans as governor and the majority of the state's seats in the US House of Representatives and the state assembly. For Democrats, their worst fears had come to pass and they plotted their way back to power. In 1898, they staged a coup d'etat in the city of Wilmington. It was the state's largest urban area and it was a success story. African-Americans there were moving into the middle class. Three members of the board of aldermen were black as were numerous public sector employees. The daily record was a black owned newspaper and as a daily, it was the only one of its kind in the nation. So democracy seemed to be on the rise. But uh, on the morning of November 10th, there were nearly 2000 white men who belonged to paramilitary groups like the one pictured here on the left, the, uh, the red shirts. And they gathered and they marched to the city armory. Then they went to the offices of the Daily Record, set the building on fire and watched it burn. They then ad advanced through black neighborhoods and murdered hundreds of residents. They dragged prominent people from their homes and took them to the train station and made them leave town. Before the day was out, the coup leaders at gunpoint forced the resignations of the mayor and aldermen and installed their own in their place. On January 6, 2021, the similarities were all too striking. Just like in 1898, armed white supremacists were once again the most visible in the insurrection. Also, in both instances, it was political party leaders who incited the violence and spread misinformation. And what occurred in both events was that these party leaders were unwilling to abide by the most fundamental principle of democracy, that when elections are held, someone will lose. And when you or your party loses, you have to accept the outcome and stand down, concede, and communicate to your supporters that they must do the same. So the overarching question in our book is whether we should be fundamentally worried today that democracy is in peril. Now, some would say, despite everything that has ensued, that democracy has prevailed and we had a transfer of power, albeit not a peaceful one. Many think the United States is protected by having the oldest constitution in the world, complete with its system of checks and balances intended to fragment power. The United States is wealthy, a factor that makes the loss of democracy unlikely. In addition, while the nation in the 1790s included institutions that repudiated democracy, most of all slavery, and I would argue the United States did not become a full democracy until the 1960s and 1970s, still it's fair to say that democracy progressed over time, becoming more robust and inclusive. On the other hand, one can say that American democracy um, can be considered to be at risk of deteriorating or backsliding. We've learned from those who study democratic deterioration in other nations that these days we don't tend to see democracy taken at the barrel of a gun or canceled elections or the disbanding of a legislature. Rather, it tends to happen in more subtle ways. Typically elections are still held and yet democracy decays and it becomes a hybrid with some democratic features, but some that are more like autocracy. 
In other words, we shouldn't be thinking of democracy as ha be having operating according to an on off switch where you have either democracy or autocracy, but rather of a continuum. And the question is whether at any point in time, we're moving toward becoming a more full democracy or backsliding in the direction of autocracy. So that's the question in our book. We examined five earlier periods in American history when people were concerned about backsliding. And we observed the patterns that ensued. And then we analyzed our own contemporary period in light of what we've learned from the past. Now, by democracy, we mean a system of representative government with accountability to citizens. And there are four pillars that make this work. There's free and fair elections, which of course is fundamental for individuals to have the right to decide who their representatives and public officials are, um, and for the results of elections to be um, respected. The rule of law, meaning that we have a society that's not governed by personal power of a few individuals or vigilantes or religious leaders, but rather by a set of rules that applies to everyone and no one, even the president is above the law. Uh, the legitimate legitimacy of the opposition means that those with different views must be able to compete for political power and to govern when they win elections and when they lose to look forward to doing so the next time around with a chance of winning. Um, and then finally, the integrity of rights. Um, a liberal democracy depends upon the integrity of rights, of having uh, civil rights and civil liberties and voting rights um, for all citizens. So these four features give us indic indicators that we assess in each of the five periods that we look at um, in order to evaluate whether democracy is retreating. And we've learned from those who study democracy around the world that there are four threats that can make democracy vulnerable. So here they are, they'll probably all sound quite familiar to you, um, but now I'm going to go through each of them in turn. So the first one, of course, is political polarization. And uh, democracy works well when there are multiple groups and identities in a society and people have overlapping and cross-cutting affiliations. In other words, you might associate with people who have different political views than you do, whether that's in your place of work or um, civic organizations you belong to, place of worship, whatever. And uh, through all of those different affiliations you have um, encounter um, people with different views. What's problematic is when these differences increasingly line up and people sort themselves out into what becomes like two camps of us versus them. And then politics ceases to be a process involving negotiation and accommodation. Rather, it becomes like mortal combat and opponents can feel like enemies. And um, you know, we, we are, are recognizing this happening among the American public um, and signs of it are um, the kind of negative partisanship people have of viewing members of the other party more and more negatively over time um, and anger and resentment um, that have been emerging. We also see it among lawmakers, of course, in, in Congress. Um, and uh, you know, as Francis Lee argues, the problem in Congress may be less about ideological polarization and more about teamsmanship. Because since 1980, the parties have been fiercely competitive in Congress because either one stands to win any election. And so they really seek to emphasize their differences um, and to discipline those who step uh, out of line and would work with the other side. Um, so the accumulation of these can lead to politics um, seeming like an existential crisis and moral combat where um, partisans feel that they need to win at all costs. The second major threat is what we call conflict over who belongs or the boundaries of the political community. So democracy works well when people agree on who is a member and what their status is. But if you have an unresolved formative rift in the nation's founding over who is included, that can reemerge as a source of trouble again and again, whether it's over race, ethnicity, gender, uh, et cetera. And in the periods that we examine, battles over race take center stage, especially concerning those who are most overtly excluded in the nation's founding, African-Americans 
And, um, you know, when there are conflicts over who belongs, um, you tend to have a group of people who are saying that they are in danger of losing their way of life um, and their culture. And we've heard a lot of this in, in recent years as well. Um, and a desire to um, reinstate um, hierarchies of the past, social hierarchies of the past. Um, and when one group is willing to do so at all costs, then democracy is endangered. Economic inequality, when it is high and rising, also is known to endanger democracy. Um, and the question is why? And before I got into the literature on this, I assumed the idea was that the 99% would rise up and have a revolution. But indeed, it's actually the opposite argument that, um, that is made by, by um, some scholars. And that is that as uh, economic inequality increases, the affluent become worried that the masses will impose redistributive policies and higher taxes. And so to protect their interests, they seek to solidify their power and they're willing to support repressive measures if that's what it takes. Um, and when the rich are willing to protect their interests at all costs, never mind democracy, then uh, it's certainly endangered. And then finally, the fourth threat is executive aggrandizement. So the enlargement and concentration of the powers of the nation's top leader in the United States, uh, the president. Um, and uh, when this leads to the demise of checks and balances, it can make a nation more prone to tyranny. Um, the American presidency has been growing more powerful since the 1930s. And indeed, both parties have actually contributed to this aggrandizement. Um, so the president becomes a kind of, you know, unitary actor um, and, you know, as polarization grows and people are frustrated that the Congress is not acting and doing things, there can be even more pressure for um, presidents to go it alone and to, um, to act in a more powerful way. Um, so, um, so the presidency provides tools for those who would run roughshod over democracy um, and, and it uh, allows for the weaponization of the presidency. So all four of these uh, threats have waxed and waned and combined in different ways throughout American history. And the main thing we have learned in our study of the past is that in fact, American democracy has been fragile time and again. Um, and you know, this was, I think a big revelation to me in that, you know, growing up in the period I have and, um, you know, growing up from the middle of the 20th century onward, it was a period that was relatively um, calm for American democracy. But if we look further back to the past, we see that there's been a lot of crisis. So listen for a moment to this description. Um, political polarization had been growing for years. Each action by one camp provoked an even greater counter reaction from their opponents. Then the president signed into law provisions that made it more difficult for immigrants to attain citizenship and permitted the United States to de deport those who were deemed dangerous or to be from hostile nations. In addition, the president signed a law that would allow for the prosecution of journalists who openly criticized his administration. Both were efforts to weaken the political opposition. In fact, while that might sound like 2017 or 2018, in fact, it was 1798 and it was President John Adams who had just signed the Alien and Sedition Acts. Adams' emergent party, uh, the Federalists, defended these acts as essential for national security, or as one congressman at the time put it, there was no need to, quote, invite hordes of wild Irishmen, nor the turbulent and disorderly of all the world to come here with a basic view to distract our tranquility." End quote. Indeed, no sooner was the ink dry on the US Constitution than Americans became deeply polarized. Public officials led the way, among them leaders who just years earlier had spoken of the mischiefs of faction. The Washington administration already had a media outlet called the Gazette of the United States that was established to promote favorable views of it. Thomas Jefferson created a competing newspaper, the National Gazette here on the left, to give voice to the emerging opposition, the Republicans. A war of words commenced and James Madison and Jefferson wrote anonymously for the Republican newspaper, lambasting the Federalists 
and Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton penned vitriolic responses, also anonymously, defending the Federalists. Ordinary Americans also took sides. Federalists and Republicans often resided in different neighborhoods and attended different churches. As hostilities grew, they each took on their own ways of demonstrating their patriotism. Here on the right, you see um, the ambassador John Jay being burned in effigy by Republicans after George Washington sent him to Britain to negotiate an unpopular trade agreement. So polarization grew quickly. Political leaders had not yet developed the concept of a legitimate political opposition, that groups could take different approaches to governing and compete with each other routinely through the political process. Their conflicts took on the proportions of mortal combat because they viewed the very existence of the nation as being at stake. Many Americans watching this growing division worry that self-government may not survive the decade. They fear that monarchy might reassert itself aristocracy replace representative government, or that some states might secede from the union and cause its demise. The point is that early American democracy was fragile. And in that era, there was one threat alone that was, was really acting, and that was polarization. So first I want to tell you about uh, the Whiskey Rebellion. So in 1791, people living near the frontier in Western Pennsylvania did not like the new federal tax on whiskey that was part of Hamilton's financial plan. They declared themselves obligated to, quote, obstruct the operation of the law until we are able to obtain its total repeal, end quote. Most of them did so peacefully, but others used violence. Rebels accosted federal tax collectors and they tarred and feathered them or destroyed their homes. Federal officials uh, began to fear for their lives in the area. The Whiskey Rebellion simmered for three years. And, and here you see in, the, in this artwork um, uh, from the time, there are uh, some of these rebels have taken a tax, federal tax collector and they've tarred and feathered him, which was a form of torture, which sounds pretty gruesome, pretty awful at the time. A person was um, stripped of their clothing, rolled in hot oil, and then rolled in feathers that stuck to them. And apparently it was horrendous. And then this person is um, put on top of a rail, um, which is also um, a form of torture from that period of time. So um, in 1794, 6,000 of these rebels gathered, uh, plotting to disrupt the federal mail service and to attack uh, Pittsburgh to seize ammunition. President Washington feared that, that civil war was imminent and decided that the insurrection needed to be put down by force. So he ordered a 15,000 man militia gathered from four states to march to the region. He himself led the mission, riding serenely on horseback. And um, I, was, I was quite amazed to find this artwork. Uh, here he is. Um, Gathering, gathering up the troops and leading the mission on horsework. So this is the one time in American history where the president has in their role as commander of chief actually led troops to put down an insurrection of American citizens. Um, so uh, by the time the troops arrived, however, to Western Pennsylvania, the, the rebels had fled into the frontier um, and the insurrection had subsided. Um, so they rounded up a few people, tried to bring charges against them, had very little flimsy evidence to do so, and most of it ended up being thrown out of court. Um, the next big crisis was of the Democratic Republican societies. Now, we would not see this as a crisis today. These were civic groups that organ were organized by citizens themselves. They proliferated from Maine to South Carolina during the 1790s, and they encouraged citizens to learn about government and take a stand on issues, basically to be good citizens. Uh, they openly criticized the Washington administration, which they thought had abandoned the revolution's ideals. But the Federalists, those who were governing the Washington administration, held more traditional and hierarchical views. They thought that citizens had a role only in elections. And aside from that, that they um, should uh, leave public officials alone to govern and uh, to be treated with deference. President Washington became incensed by these Democratic Republican societies. He thought it was wholly inappropriate for groups to organize politically and, and try to influence government. Um, and he, without any evidence, held them responsible for the Whiskey Rebellion. 
um, he said, quote, my mind is so perfectly convinced that if these self-created societies cannot be discountenanced, they will destroy the government of this country, end quote. Washington appealed to Congress to stand behind him by issuing a resolution to condemn the societies. Madison and Jefferson deeply disapproved and they considered this action akin to demanding a loyalty oath while denouncing civic activity by ordinary citizens. Madison called it the greatest error of the president's political life. Then the, the next big chapter was of nullification. The uh, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions um, Thomas Jefferson believed that the Alien and Sedition Acts endangered the basic right of dissent and amounted to an illegal usurpation of power by the Federalists. So he and Madison turned to the Republican dominated states of Kentucky and Virginia and helped them issue resolutions declaring these laws to be an unconstitutional use of federal power and that the states would consider them to be null and void. To the Federalists, these resolutions coming up from the states were nothing less than a direct threat to the authority authority of the federal government. Um, whereas to Republicans, they were a last ditch effort to resist federal repression of dissent and to save the union. Uh, as all of these chapters of the 1790s um, culminated, we got to the election of 1800. And as it drew near, both uh, Federalists and Republicans braced themselves for violence and some prepared for it. Uh, Republican governors in Pennsylvania and Virginia were stockpiling arms and readying their states for military action, while the Federalists took steps to ready federal arsenals, and secession or civil war seemed ever closer. The election took place and the result was deadlock. It was thrown into the House of Representatives, which was dominated by Federalists. What would they do? One possibility was outright usurpation. And, and leaving the, the presidency um, to one of their own. Three anxious months passed before Congress convened. They began balloting February 11th during a severe snowstorm. Vote after vote, day after day, the impasse remained. Finally, one person changed his mind and uh, for reasons unknown to history. But on the 36th ballot, Jefferson won. And for the first time, the presidency changed hands from one party to another, and it managed to do so peacefully. During the 1790s, fractious political polarization had nearly done the nation in. It threatened three of the pillars of democracy, the rule of law, the legitimacy of the opposition, and the integrity of rights. And let me say a word about the settlement. We look back today and we tend to imagine the outcome of the 1800 election as a victory for democracy, but that's a mistake. The Republicans gained the most votes only because of the most fundamentally undemocratic feature of the of the US Constitution, the three-fifths clause, giving extra political power to slaveholders. Without it, the Federalists would have held on to power. If we are looking to the 1790s for some positive message about how democracy can be preserved, it fails to deliver. Slavery did become an issue as the 19th century proceeded, and by the 1850s, Americans were engaged in deep conflict. The parties grew polarized over the issue, and a secession and bloody civil war ensued, and all four pillars of democracy were threatened and harmed along the way. And that happened with the confluence of three threats. Um, three threats, these same three threats um, combined once again um, in the, uh, the 1890s, as I was discussing at the beginning, and I wanna to return to that era now. A few months after the Wilmington coup, the North Carolina Democratic Party leaders took measures statewide to make their power permanent. They scaled back voting rights by establishing poll taxes and literacy tests. As one Democrat, a state senator put it, he favored, quote, a good square honest law that will always give us a good Democratic majority, end quote. What happened in North Carolina Carolina brought out into the open a major transformation that was occurring more quietly all over the South as white elites shut down the political opposition. The federal government, including Republican presidents, permitted this. In 1898, President McKinley heard the pleas of African Americans in Wilmington asking for help but failed to intervene. As disenfranchisement happened in state after state, uh, Theodore Roosevelt simply watched. Then President Taft went so far as to praise the restrictive rules for excluding what he called an ignorant, irresponsible element from the electorate. 
by the end of the 1890s, all four pillars of democracy had suffered harm. The main result was the disenfranchisement of millions of black men and some poor whites. And once blacks lost political power, their civil liberties and civil rights were taken away as well. Jim Crow was established and it lasted 60 years. And white Southern elites regained extra political power, not only to rule in their own states as autocrats, but also to exercise an outsized voice in national politics for the next half century. Democratic backsliding in the 1890s was hardly inevitable. Three threats to democracy had coalesced and political leaders took advantage of them in ways that led to severe backsliding. That racism drove democratic backsliding was plain to see. Um, Southern Democrats embraced political uh, white supremacy because it worked incredibly well as a political strategy to unify whites and to sanction the removal from the electorate of members of the opposition. But while racism was the most overt threat, it did not act alone. There was a high degree of political polarization um, and between parties in the South at that time. Um, and economic inequality was also soaring in the 1890s, uh, but its role uh, can easily be missed because economic elites were divided between regions and parties, but they were instrumental nonetheless. Although much has changed, the politics of the 1890s reverberates in our own times. Then as now, we witness a high degree of polarization and rising economic inequality. Some political leaders use race baiting, including that directed toward immigrants, to fuel anger and to promote political participation among white supporters. White supremacy and polarization animate politics and can obscure the purposeful activities of economic elites to achieve their policy goals. So um, in sum, these historical periods reveal that American democracy has been more fragile than we might think. The United States has undergone numerous crises when democracy risked severe deterioration. It's been a tumultuous history, um, and it's only the past half century that seems serene by comparison until the last few years. Over and over again, the nation risked instability, violence, and the demise of rights. All four characteristics were threatened repeatedly, and on occasion, backsliding occurred, some of it with long enduring consequences. The four threats have waxed and waned throughout history and combined in different ways. High political polarization in all three of the earlier periods seemed particularly dangerous and volatile when it combined with conflict over membership and status. And when three threats converge, as occurred in uh, two, two occasions, the uh, 1850s and the 1890s, it led to the most dramatic uh, crises and backsliding. Um, I haven't, I, I'm not going to take the time to talk about the 1930s or 1970s, though I'll gladly do that in the Q&A. Um, but those two 20th century periods, we had executive aggrandizement acting on its own. Um, and the fact that the other threats were at a low ebb, I believe, helped to contain those crises. Um, yet the four threats do not by themselves determine what unfolds in politics. They don't operate according to some predictable equation. Um, rather, political actors at any given time period can exert their will and make choices. And it is they, elected official, officials and organizational leaders and citizens, who make the crucial difference in whether threats will materialize into full-scale danger and damage. Um, so they and we may or may not choose to engage in action to save democracy. So what about today? Um, today, for the first time ever, um, we face the convergence of all four threats at once. And this means that democracy is genuinely at risk. So let me give you a few snapshots of measures, ways to think about this. Um, first, in terms of political polarization, here you have rising polarization in Congress in both chambers, um, the House and the Senate on the left, um, and as uh, shown on the right, the uh, Republican Party, particularly um, moving to the extremes um, over recent decades. Um, among the electorate, there's this growth of negative partisanship of people having more negative attitudes toward the other party. Um, and when they vote in elections, um, having often having the attitude, not so much that they love their own candidate, but that they um, are terrified of the other candidate. Um, 
We're also seeing rising conflict over membership and that's combining with political polarization. And this was really striking to me. So here, uh, what this graph is plotting is attitudes about racial resentment. It's um, an index that combines a few survey questions. Um, and if you look back to the 1980s, white Republicans and white Democrats were not very different in their views on racial resentment, but they've grown apart since that time and um, you know, you can see sort of a, a glass half empty, glass half full story here um, that you know, one party, Democrats, have become much more embracing of equality over this time period, but Republicans have become more concerned about um, protecting their way of life, reinstating status hierarchies, and that's reflected in these attitudes about racial resentment. Um, and so uh, the, the gap between the parties is very large now, and um, and that's it's dangerous. And of course, um, this is a familiar graph, I think, to many. Rising economic inequality. Here you can see across you know the whole 20th century and up to the present, uh, this U-shaped graph that we are now up to these um, high levels that we were in uh, of inequality that we were in the early 20th century. We don't have any neat measure of executive aggrandizement. Um, but it has been growing um, since the 1930s with, with both parties contributing to that. Now, all of these threats um, were rising long before um, President Trump entered the White, ran for office or entered the White House. Um, we see him more as a, a symptom than a cause, uh, his candidacy and, and his election as a symptom um, rather than a cause. But then once in the White House, he certainly actively intensified all of the threats and caused real harm. Um, and the threats have taken on a life of their own at this point, and they're on course to persist for years. We are, uh, we're likely to undergo uh, years of what Dan Slater calls careening through volatile party conflict that could produce backsliding. So the question for Americans has to be how to preserve and restore democracy and to make that our top priority so that we can pass it on to future generations. Whether democracy can be saved and indeed broadened and deepened depends on the choices made by political leaders and citizens. American history has been full of such choices and in some instances, people chose a destructive path as in the 1890s and in others, they found a productive way forward. If history is any guide, we can't take democracy for granted. And democracy has always been what Abraham Lincoln called unfinished work, awaiting renewal and expansion by each new generation. With the nation divided right down the middle, he said in his second inaugural, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. Our times call on us to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, audience, please um, use the question answer, uh, answer button uh, to the lower right of your Zoom ribbon um, to answer your questions. Um, and I'll give you a second. Um, Professor Mettler, um, you know, one of your book does focus on the recurring threats. Um, but you mentioned at the end that there are moments of genuine democratic expansion in our country that are themselves recurrent. Um, universal white male suffrage in the 1820s, um, emancipation suffrage. Um, what can we learn from these moments of democratic expansion that might also give us things to think about in this moment of polarization? What are the seeds of the extension of the franchise in this country. Of course, asking you immediately to think of a different book than, <laughs> than the one you just discussed now. Um, but have, have you, you, you certainly must have thought about this um, cycle of expansion and erosion and, and, and how Obama might have thought about this as, you know, the, the clawing the expansion of the franchise, the long steady march towards more democracy. So um, what do you think of these moments and what can we learn from them? Well, that's a really nice question. Um, and, you know, I, I actually think that until five years ago, 
the strand that was running through a lot of my work was thinking about the expansion of democracy, when democracy was expanded and what the limits were on it when that happened and, um, and so on. But um, so, and, and you know, I, I think I had tended to focus on those periods um, and to have the kind of view that, um, that Barack Obama articulates and he gave that speech at the Democratic National Convention last summer um, where, um, well, actually he, he gave um, speeches, excuse me, often while he was president that, um, that talked about um, democracy, though, you know, it was very limited at many times in the American past, was still expanding, that you could see this trajectory, even if it was a step forward, step back, that you could, uh, two steps forward, one step back, you could see this forward movement of, um, of progress. Um, and so it was new for me to really start thinking about more of the steps backward and the backsliding and the threats, um, as we do in this book. But, you know, I mean, it is certainly, um, those periods of expansion that have given real life to democracy and that have made it much more re robust over time as people have, um, have gained, uh, you know, as, as, as um, civil rights have become widespread um, and voting rights and um, a, as well as uh, civil liberties. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's, um, there's something in that that does take on a life of its own and it's what can save us, you know? I mean, in this election of 2020, it was very striking to me that we had the highest voter turnout that we'd had since, you know, the early 20th century, which clearly showed that, you know, people cared a lot about the stakes. Um, and so if you look just at that, it seems that, you know, democracy um, is strong in Americans' um, willingness to, to really do something. And like we've been saying for decades, you know, this low political participation. Well, here you have during a pandemic, people participating at such high rates. And um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, maybe to answer a little more directly your question, um, Judith, Judith Sklar, the, who was the a late political theorist, um, talked about um, status as American citizens as including uh, both the right to vote and the right to work. And, um, and I think that you, know, you could add to the right to vote all kinds of other political acts that people have the right to participate in. Um, and I think we go through periods where we kind of forget about that and take it for granted. Um, at a period during of expansion of those rights, people are very aware of them. But um, as they have come to be under threat in recent years, perhaps it has led to some kind of a rekindling of people's awareness of how much those rights matter. Thank you, I was really thought provoking. Um, Elizabeth Muehlman raises a question I'm, I'm certain you've gotten a lot as you've thought through this project, which is um, throughout your study of the threats of democracy, um, do you look at the role of the media, um, you know, the systemic agenda uh, during times of expansion and threat? What is, what is the role of the media in, in stimulating attacks on democracy uh, or being the watchdog that calls, us, uh, calls out and calls attention to the threats? Yeah, to this was so interesting. I mean, as, as Rob and I worked on this book, you know, we were learning about these periods that we hadn't studied before. And then we would get together, um, you know, this is pre-pandemic, obviously. We'd get together and we'd talk about them and we'd find these themes running through them. And one theme running through all of our periods was the role of the media. And it starts, as I mentioned in my talk today, at the very beginning <laughs> where you have, you know, for any of you who've seen Hamilton, this is uh, the, the musical Hamilton, this is no surprise, but um, where you have, you know, the, the leaders of the nation engaged in what are essentially anonymous op-eds where they're lambasting each other through the media and they're using the media as a medium. Um, and so, and we, we see that time and again um, throughout history um, and, you know, early on, it was a very partisan media. 
it was not the kind of investigative journalism, you know, the sort of Walter Cronkite story of um, that uh, of the middle of the 20th century, which we often now, when we talk about the problems with partisan media, we kind of talk about the middle of the 20th century as if that was the norm, like that's how the media used to be. But that was indeed exceptional because in the 1790s, the 1850s, the 1890s, um, in all of those periods, there was very partisan media. And um, I would say, you know, like you really can't say that the media was um, simply a watchdog for democracy or simply a partisan tool because it could be either of those um, depending upon the context. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of folks today tend to assume that the people have said to me, you're missing the main threat. You're talking about four threats and you're missing the main threat, it's, it's the media. And for Rob and I, what we think is that polarization is the threat and media takes the form that it does given the level of polarization that you have. Um, and in other periods with less polarization that um, the media can simply be a watchdog of democracy. I wanna pull on that for a second because I, th I think it's really interesting. Um, one of the things when I teach introduction to American politics that gives me chill every time is when I present the work on the spillover of effective polarization and negative partisanship mm -hmm. in ways that are contaminating non-political life. You know, the way that um, Americans are now making judgments about the quality and character of their fellow Americans in non-political events um, through the lens of partisanship. And I've been very interested in wondering historically what the antecedents to this were, whether there were similar moments in our country or others where political identity so, uh, so markedly infected secular life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, it, apparently it did already in the 1790s. I don't know how widespread that was. Um, but there were, you know, indications I came across in the research of, of it already being a problem. It was certainly the case in the 1890s, you know, in looking at this case of, of um, North Carolina, for example, there were these um, newspapers that were basically run by the, um, the Democratic Party, this, you know, white elite party. Um, and, um, you know, they were, um, they were overtly a white supremacist in tone. And um, it certainly infiltrated social life at that time um, and vice versa. I mean, I think there, there was not a real separation. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that has certainly happened in, in the American past. You receive high praise from a dual threat of Professor Michael Tesla and Mary McThomas. So this is high praise indeed, who say this fantastic talk and they really appreciate the interactive element of the four threats. But is there one threat, as you just said, that seems to be most important? So, yeah. um, so it's polarization. Well, interesting. So first of all, thank you for those generous comments. I'm very honored to hear that from scholars I respect so much. Um, so yeah, Rob and I, talked about this is one of the threats most important. And we never came to a conclusive answer. Um, so I tend to think, and so now I'm really speaking for myself, not the two of us, everything I've said up till now, I think Rob would firmly endorse. Um, I tend to think that polarization is the most important threat because you, know, you see it in these two instances, the 1850s, 1890s, when it's combined with other threats, that is as it is now in our current time, that that's very dangerous because of the ways they, um, they interact with each other, you know, and the other threats become really combustible in combination with polarization. Um, whereas um, when you have, uh, and polarization acting all by itself in the 1790s was really dangerous and, and the nation, you know, almost, came to its demise in, in the first decade. Um, so 
that's my hunch, but you know, that that's, the jury is still somewhat out on that because, you know, we would need better ways to, to study that and to think about that. And, you know, maybe this is where the comparativists could really help us with having, you know, if we had large data sets to look at this more systematically, that would be valuable. Well, let's turn to a few comparativists then um, who are gonna ask similar questions. So Professor Sarah Goodman asks about bright lines. She says the four threats are very interesting, important, but she's curious if you could think any of these can be diagnosed a priori, that is before the onset of crisis, or whether these are factors that only become apparent after the fact. For example, is there a threshold for thinking about executive aggrandizement, polarization, or contestation over membership that you would say, as you see them unfolding, clearly moves from tolerable to intolerable for democracy? And are we seeing them unfold right now? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really nice question. And here again, if we, you know, I showed you just in talking about the contemporary period, some contemporary measures that we can use to look at these things, but most of these measures don't go all that far back. And we, um, we don't really have data for thinking about this over time, um, particularly for thinking about like polarization among ordinary citizens, the electorate, and how to measure that over time. So, um, so in the absence of having those kinds of measures, it's hard to be really definitive in saying these things um, and to, to say, you know, what is the threshold level beyond which you really have a crisis. But um, we are in a period of, of real crisis now. And, you know, it was really striking to Rob and I how, as you know, we started working on the book um, together with our colleagues in the American Democracy Collaborative, we wrote an article that then kind of launched this book. And um, maybe some of you have seen that with, um, with Tom Papinski and Ken Roberts and um, the comparativists keeping us honest and, um, and Rick Vallely. Um, and, uh, and then, so it was after that, that we started working on this book. So, you know, it was about four years ago and we kind of, you know, arrived at, at the general theory that we argue. And then, you know, it was striking as time moved forward. I kept tracking what was happening in terms of threat to any of the four pillars. And it, um, the frequency of damage, of threats to the pillars and actual damage escalated as time went on. And 2020, once we sent, sent the book off for print uh, to, to, to be published, that's when things really took off um, all the more so. I mean, I think the, the latter part of 2020, um, there was really a lot of, of threat and, and actual damage. And, you know, and now we're seeing, I mean, this is so much like the 1890s in that in, in the wake of those events and the denial of the election results by Republicans, that now there are um, these new laws being enacted in states to scale back voting rights. Um, so to try to, um, you know, reinforce um, the power of the Republican Party. I mean, it's a clear power grab. There, there's no evidence that these laws are needed for any other reason. Um, and so I, I think it's very dangerous and it's going to continue to be. Uh, another comparativist, uh, Professor Jeff Kopstein writes, not many students of American politics raise the regime type question, whether the United States will be a democracy or something else. Do you think it should have more prominent place in the subfield permanently, or is it really more appropriate for a given moment? He says he's asking for a comparativist friend. Yeah, right. No, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, um, some years ago when I, um, I was the editor of one of those Oxford volumes that maybe some of you have been involved in, and it was on American political development. And we presented, uh, we had a panel at, at the APSA about the the um, the volume once it was produced, and um, and one person Dan Stid I still remember political scientist Dan Stid at the Hewlett Foundation he said, do you th um, think that the United States is in danger of regime change? And at the time, and I mean I don't I forget what year this was maybe it was uh, 2014. At the time I just couldn't even wrap my head around that question. 
And so if you'd asked me that then, I would have really kind of been puzzled. I actually think now, I mean, now I think our textbooks are, are really inadequate. And um, I do, th I mean, I've, I've long thought we ought to think about the United States in comparative perspective more. We ought to think about the United States more the way comparativists do. And I think that we ought to um, be thinking in those terms. I mean, frankly, you know, when I was teaching intro to American politics a few years ago in 2015 and 2016, I started to feel like I didn't have the vocabulary for what we were undergoing, like things that I had long thought were settled, like um, the respect for the legitimacy of elections and, um, and the freedom of the media, et cetera, suddenly seemed up for grabs. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that this is kind of a wake up call to us as Americanists that we need to think of the United States in terms of um, regime and, and in terms of whether, you know, democracy is being, is becoming more robust in any period or whether, and in our own period, or whether it's endangered and how specific ways, you know, you could have both things happening at once, some things that are becoming stronger and some, some things that are endangered. We ought to be thinking in those ways and assessing democracy. I think we've been kind of, you know, taking it for granted for a long time, um, even when we shouldn't have been because, you know, someone like Veshla Weevil, Weaver will argue that, you know, there has been, there have been strands of authoritarianism um, in our contemporary period, if you look at the carceral state. Um, and uh, so we, we should always be thinking more in these terms. I'm so glad you brought up Vesla Weaver and Gwen Prose's article that uh, for the audience, I put it in the chat, a wonderful, uh, well, an important read for students of American politics like ourselves on racial authoritarianism in America th that argues that the discipline um, by by failure of scope, failure to appreciate racial authoritarianism hasn't asked the right questions and has been sluggish to respond to this crisis um, in many ways because of it. So it's a terribly important article. Um, your former student, Daniel Thompson, um, has a, a really interesting question, one that I'm sure shaped by her research. I'd be just as interested to hear her thoughts um, when we are able to have our own colloquia. Um, and Professor Thompson says, um, thanks so much for a terrific talk and situating the Kermit moment in a broader historical context. A challenge going forward is related to the fact that so many of the Republicans in office undermined the transfer of power. Some corporations have stepped in and said they will not support their reelection, but it is likely that many of these lawmakers will serve in Congress for years or decades to come. How does the slim odds of replacing these political elites also impact the future of democracy? Let's well, say the very last sentence. How does the slim odds of replacing these political elites and apparently the support for them among party elites impact the future of democracy? Too? Yeah, that's a great question. And hello, Danielle. So good uh, to know that you're out there. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, this is, is really interesting. And let me comment on one part of the question at the beginning first, you mentioned corporations. Um, you know, a, a central argument here in our book is that economic inequality is a threat to democracy. And, um, you know, I did throughout uh, Trump's time in office, I kind of kept watching to see um, would corporations speak out against him. And, you know, they did a little bit after his response to Charlottesville in 2017, but then they were very quiet. And so, you know, Paul Pearson and Jacob Hacker's argument that, you know, um, the affluent were basically getting what they wanted, tax cuts and deregulation and so on, you know, seemed on, on the mark. It was interesting though, after the 2020 election that um, corporations um, really objected to those who were denying the election results and did so increasingly up through January and then after January 6th as well. Um, and we're very firm about that. Whereas, um, you know, it's interesting to look at who did stick with the Republican party and, you know, most rank and file Republicans did. Um, and so that's very striking to me. And so, um, and, you know, 
Um, given the way we are sorted as citizens by um, states and con congressional districts and the sorting of the population, I think, you, Danielle, you're right that those folks have, most seats are, um, of those folks are safe seats. Um, and so I think that is a danger to democracy going forward. I mean, um, a seat that might not be safe is a seat of someone like Lynn Cheney, who's, you know, been, um, just despite her, you know, very conservative um, uh, credentials in terms of public policy, she is standing up for the Constitution, and she's in trouble with her party for that. Um, so um, it's you know those few here in the district where I live in Syracuse, New York. John Katko was one of the I think was it 10, 11 members of of the House who um, voted for impeachment in January. Um, uh, Republicans um, who voted for impeachment, um, and you know he's going to be in, in hot water um, going forward in, in this district. Um, so I I think you're right. I think it's it's a um, it's a real danger going forward. So um, yeah, Professor David Meyer. Um wants to bring us forward to what we can do or what's being done right now. And he writes, the Biden gamble at the moment is that the federal government can, by extending social and political rights, take the steam out of anti-democratic forces and build support for the institutions of government. Does this approach make sense to you? Is he missing something important? Yeah. Hmm. Well, here again, just like with, with each of you who's asked the question, I'm dying to know your answer to it. So hello, David. It's also good to be um, hearing from you. Um, I, I do think that Biden is doing just about the best job anyone could right now, um, given the challenges that we face as a nation. Um, and I think that, you know, his effort. So there is an uptick right now in um, Americans' desire for government to do more to address problems and willingness to have a little larger government. I, I don't want to overstate that. I think that could be fleeting. But, um, but Biden is really responding to that and, you know, has these big ambitious plans. Um, and uh, I think that part of the idea is just to you know, well, let me back up for a second. I think a big part of um, the underlying issues that that maybe underscores several of these threats is Americans declining trust in government, which has been, you know, declining for more or less for a half a century. I think that Biden is trying to seize on this moment to, um, build more trust in government and more of a sense from Americans that government is doing something clear and visible and tangible for them that is helpful, that will help them to um, take care of their families. And um, so with, you know, providing um, with, through the infrastructure plan, providing lots of jobs, repairing infrastructure, creating infrastructure for the future. Um, and also um, with the whole American Families Plan, which includes a lot that would help people to, you know, balance, you know, work life challenges of, you know, taking care of children at home, new babies, sick family members, et cetera, as well as paid sick leave. I mean, it's extraordinary. The United States is one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have paid sick leave. And it's of the affluent nations, it's the only one. And uh, most have much more have generous paid sick leave. Um, so you know, if any of these things can be accomplished, and at the moment I think maybe some of them will. It will happen only through reconciliation, but um, that can help people feel like government is doing something for them again. And I think that you know. I don't expect radical change of um, given how deep polarization is, but I think in terms of peeling off some independence to be um, supportive of voting for democratic candidates, that that might help. And if that sounds partisan, I mean, here's what's going on is that right now we have one party that is standing up for democracy and one party that's not. 
Um, and that's fundamentally problematic. I mean, a democracy cannot last long if that's the situation. Um, the idea has to be that both parties are willing to play by the basic rules of democracy and, um, and you know, respect, respect these pillars of democracy that, for example, when there's an election and the other side wins, that you recognize that and stand down. If you lose that, you, um, you lose democracy. And so the fact that Republicans right now are not standing up for democracy is very troubling, but I think what Biden's doing is probably the best hope of doing that. But I would love to hear thoughts that any of you have about what else should happen. Well, we'll, we'll go there in a second. We'll try to conclude, if not on an optimistic note, on a note of what your sense is of what can be done to prevent these four threats from taking American democracy from us. But before I do, I, I, I have to ask, um, you spoke movingly at the beginning of today's talk about how you reacted to the January 6th insurrection and how it made sense to me, it resonated. You, you, you struggled to find words for what we were witnessing. Are there moments of the past decade that just stand out to you? Just when you saw them unfolding or tumbling out of an elite's mouth, you, you were bewildered or, or really made you shudder um, for our democracy. And what would you say to alumni or non-academic non social scientists here um, about how your colleagues and yourself are reacting to this moment in American politics? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I'm, um, I feel like there are so many, <laughs> there have been so many moments that I'm almost not sure where to begin. And I'm sure that once this talk is over, I'll spend the next couple of days thinking of things I wish I'd mentioned. Um, but um, yeah, so many. Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned Charlottesville in, in passing, but, um, you know, I think if that had happened on any other president's watch, um, Republican or Democrat, that they would have firmly and quickly condemned what happened there. And the white supremacist and, and Nazi um, and you know, pro-Confederacy kinds of forces that were underlying it, that they would have quickly spoken out against that. And um, the fact that, that Trump did not do that um, was deeply troubling. And you, know, you could go from there, you know, all the way on to um, you know, the grand culmination on uh, January 6th. And, you know, after a while, it became less surprising that Trump would not speak out against these things. But then the fact that other Republicans in Congress barely spoke out against them was, um, was deeply, deeply troubling. Um, so, um, yeah, I would say, you know, I, um, I'm lucky to be in, in my department at Cornell where I've, you know, I've really learned so much from the many comparativists who study democratic deterioration around the world and who've, who've helped me to, you know, learn how to think about this stuff, giving, you know, by, from the literature that they draw on and their own work and having a vocabulary. But I think that all of us have been, have been really deeply, deeply troubled. Um, by, by what's ensued. And we, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's fantastic that Americans voted at such high rates and voted for the candidate who was sticking up for democracy, um, in this case, Biden. Um, and, and that is, you know, to be celebrated. But Trump nearly won re-election. I mean, he came very close to winning re-election. And, um, and I, I think that the, the way ahead, we're going to have a lot of tough sledding ahead. Um, so, uh, so these are continue to be tumultuous times. So then the question of what can be done. Um, yeah. Either through democracy reform or mass movement. What, what, what's your short suggestion? Yeah. 
Well, I do think that protecting voting rights is really, really important. So, you know, the HR 1 is, is the legislation to try to protect voting rights. And of course, um, you know, it's not clear that it has, it certainly does not have the 60 votes in the Senate to be filibuster proof. And so should the um, Democrats um, be willing to violate, to, to go to terminate the filibuster in order to do this? Um, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think when democracy is at what, what's at stake, um, that, that that is necessary. I mean, it's not desirable. I mean, Joe Manchin says, I don't like the idea of having voting reform that's only supported by one party. And, you know, it's nice to uphold that idea that things should be bipartisan, but when you have the other party is really being an opponent to democracy, then the burden falls upon Democrats to protect it. Um, so that's very problematic. So that's one thing. Um, I think, you know, for, for citizens, um, it means, um, really, um, you know, being very involved, which, you know, we, we saw from voter turnout in the fall that people are really involved, but to continue to be um, not just in presidential elections. I mean, a lot of people who participate in presidential elections stay home in midterms, and that can happen. If that happens, um, then we're going to be in very tough shape. Um, so people need to um, keep being active and protecting democracy. Um, and, you know, in discussion, I mean, so many of us have friends and family who feel very differently about all of this. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have relatives who think that Trump was sent by God um, to be president. Um, and I think that, you know, all that we can do is just continue to try to have to engage in conversations that are um, a to be as reasonable as possible about you know what it takes to live together in a diverse pluralistic society where we might have different religious viewpoints and um, and different values and yet we have to have some rules of the game that we're all going to abide by. So I think we, we need to kind of um, reinforce that idea. Well, I'll conclude us there and turn off my filter so I can show um, the book, which you can find a link to in the chat field. Um, I, I personally really learned a great deal from the book and the talk um, and highly recommend it for those who want to have a better grounding in American history, understanding how we've wrestled as a democracy with these threats in the past, but also why the current moment is as challenging as it is. And thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, one of the regrets I have in the Zoom era is that we can't hang out and continue this conversation more informally after the lecture concludes. But uh, I know we all benefited from it so much. So thank you, Professor Mettler, for sharing this with us today. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I only wish I was there in person to now chat with all of you, but uh, take care and be well.